time of preaching in the name of the Lord here. Now, we will go to John, the book of John, chapter number 11. John, chapter number 11. And while you're turning there, I'll try to give you a little bit of background on uh, the text and uh, the book that we are reading from. Many of you may know that John is one of the four Gospels. The Gospels are the New Testament eyewitness accounts of the life and the ministry of Jesus. They capture the message of Christ in a way that is based on eyewitness accounts. It is not a collection of stories that people heard others say, but these are all eyewitness accounts. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are uh, considered what is called synoptic gospels, or gospels that share some of the same source material uh, that uh, has, has, has been passed down through oral traditions, oral eyewitness accounts. And John, the fourth gospel, is a very unique gospel uh, version because it does not have uh, uh, a certain kind of uh, binding to the first three books. They share some of the same stories, but it is clear that the book of John has a certain theological and philosophical uh, uh, priority. It wants to help us all appreciate that Jesus was not just fully God in the sense that he was just this uh, spiritual being that appeared to be human, right? Nor was he fully human, meaning that he was just a great prophet or teacher that did not have any divine attributes, but that in the real sense, Jesus, fully human, fully God, the God-man, if you will, that Jesus uh, was and is God. John makes every effort by declaring through theological, philosophical uh, proofs and examples that the God we serve uh, so loved the world that he gave Jesus, his only son, and whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. It is this Jesus, this uh, Jesus that we worship, and, and John creates a very unique take on uh, why this Jesus deserves our worship, our loyalty, our allegiance, and in many respects, why this Jesus loves us so much. Aren't you glad that he loves us that much? Amen? Yeah. And so we're in this passage of scripture, and we'll spend a few moments uh, going really deeply uh, into this passage, and prayerfully it will be something that uh, gives us all a great amount of uh, hope and significance uh, and faith. Uh, so the word of God uh, in John chapter number 11, uh, it reads uh, like this. Now a certain man was ill, and it's on the screen if you want to follow along up there. Uh, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. Mary was one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. Let me just kind of put a, a little pause in that. So Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were very close friends of Jesus. They weren't the kind of folk that just kind of had that drive-by relationship with Jesus. Jesus did something nice for just some random group of people. And then all of a sudden, it's this thing like they're sick. No, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were actually close friends to Jesus. It is commonly thought that when Jesus went to Bethany, that Jesus stayed at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So this is a big deal, right? This is like, you know, they had Jesus' personal cell phone type deal, right? They're homies. They're eight spoon coons. They get down with each other, all right? Verse number three. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love, talking about Lazarus, is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, the illness does not lead to death, rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, and after hearing that Lazarus was ill, he stayed, listen to this, two days longer in the place where he was. Jesus, after hearing his friend was sick, didn't immediately go, but he stayed there. Verse number 7, then after this he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you. 
and you are trying to go there again? Man, I don't think they was worried about Jesus. You know, they were worried about, uh, 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 what, what do you call it, uh, 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 loose stones, amen. Stones intended for Jesus that hit them upside the head. But anyhow, verse number nine, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk through the day do not stumble. And to see the light of this world, but those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. What a word. What a word. What a word. After saying this, Jesus told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. Disciples said to Jesus, Lord, if he's asleep, he'll be all right. Jesus had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. So Jesus came and told them, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. Let us go to him now. Thomas, who was the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. Clearly, they feel like we walked into a hornet's nest. Keep on reading. Jesus arrived and found Lazarus already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. Let me just say this. You know, when people died in the Jewish culture, there were professional mourners that were hired to come and make the wailing and the mourning that much more intense and public. So some paid folk who came to cry. Because they were waiting. Ain't that something? Alright? I'll show you you can't always, you know, think that everybody who's around you sharing in your emotional high or low is there out of a good place, right? Some folk are there just because they get some out of it. Well, yeah, I digress. <laughs> Verse number 20, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Mark said, Jesus, Lord, if you've been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Mary Mark said, I know he'll rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, they will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus, she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who comes to the world. Verse 28, when she had said this, she went back, called her sister Mary, told her privately, the teacher is here, he's calling for you. When she heard it, she got up, quickly went to him. Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place. Martha had met him, and the Jews who were there in the house consoling her saw Mary get up and quickly go out, so they followed her. Because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was, saw him, she knelt at his feet, said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews, the paid weepers, came with her weeping also. He was greatly disturbed in spirit deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? Word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So I'm going to speak today on this continuing series we're doing on intimacy. Uh, speak from the topic, overcoming failed expectations. Keys to overcoming failed expectations. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you and send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me, even the hearers of this word, in Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I need to overcome failed expectations. While you're at church, <laughs> that the closer you get to people, the greater risk you have of being hurt. Amen. Amen. That when you ain't close to folk, then it is likely that you have not put yourself in a space of vulnerability to be the 
disappointed or let down. And can I even go further and say that intimacy will require the risk and sometimes the reality of being failed. That it is impossible to be intimate with someone, to be close, to have your emotions and your mind and even your body and all of these precious components of yourself in close proximity with someone without having moments in your relationship where you will have your expectations let down. And one must appreciate there is a very important reality and assumption that you and I must hold dear and near to us if we're going to have a relationship with God and with people that lasts beyond the failed expectations. Dare I say that you will let people know. Mm. You have let people down. You are letting. <laughs> Somebody gonna say amen after a while. I'll wake up a bit here now. <laughs> got two weeks of preaching I got to get out of here. No. That, 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 in many respects, this, this, this intimacy that you and I long to have will also be characterized The way we say we will. Or the way we intend to be. How many of you know that one of the great characteristics of being a human being is that we are all shaped? <laughs> My God, today. Tell your name, you shape. <laughs> I'm Shay. I'm not a slim Shay, but I'm Shay. There was a time when I was a slim herd. Oh, that, that, you know, we're shady not because we just want it. Well, not all of us want to be shady, but it's just kind of what it means to be human, you know? It is this idea that I intend to be there for you, but my humanity, the limitations of my mind, my body, my my capacity will often cause me to not be able to do what I want to do. Paul says it like this, Oh, wretched man that I am. The things that I want to do, I can't do. This is Paul talking. The things that I don't want to do, I do. <laughs> Who shall save me from this wretched man? Thanks be to God. You all lift your hands and holler, thanks be to God, right? Because God but in the meantime, what do you do when you have been let down by people that you think should be there? What do you do when you've been let down by God? Hmm. Glad to have young folk in here today that will say, you know, I fasted and I prayed, came to church, paid my tithes, forgave. Loved and God, where are you? Anybody ever said that? God was what's up, God? I see the wicked prospering. <coughs> they over here just having a great time, and I'm over here struggling. They heart ain't broke, my heart is broke. They got money, I'm broke. They got friends, I ain't got nobody. Where you at, God? That sometimes following God can often cause you to feel let down. Child of God, what you need to appreciate and realize is that part of our being let down is a result of our expectations being raised because we have been in intimate or close proximity 
when someone who has demonstrated to us that they are worth the risk. I know how many of you remember when you fell in love or maybe right now you're falling in love or you that want to be in love <coughs> and uh, you met somebody and I don't know, you gave them your email, Instagram, Facebook, <laughs> Messenger, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, y'all, you know, hey, reach out, you know, hey, you know, call me, cool, yeah, I'll call you, and they, they call you the first day, and you're like, yes, 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 thank you, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about, right? And, 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 and then you, you wait for them to call you the next day, and they don't call, you're like, oh, man, and they call you, and I'm calling this third day, you're like, mm, they call you fourth day, you're like, yes, thank you, thank you, things are still on track, and, and then you, they don't call you the fifth day, and they don't call you the sixth day, and then they <laughs> you don't see them at church. You don't see them at church. Ah, so, 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 you, you just feel all disappointed. But then they call you the next day and you're like, back, you're like, ooh, thank you. This, that was a close one. That was a close one. I thought this he left. But then they call you the next day after that, the next day after that. And your expectations have been so raised that you think you're going to hear from them consistently. Maybe you just think that the day before you met this person, them calling you or not was not an issue. <laughs> Make that right, right? You was going along with your life just great. But now, just a phone call. Part of what it means to be human is that we all have expectations. Part of what it means to follow God as a human being is to appreciate that God seeks for us to be in intimacy with Him and by extension other people. And the great challenge for you and I is to not allow time to become a threat to our intimacy with God. Because how many of you know when God takes too long? Ooh, we get nervous. When God don't call you the time you think he should, some of us start calling other folk. One of the great promises in scripture, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2, you should write this down, memorize it, take a picture says, look unto Jesus, the author, finisher of your faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, seated down now at the right hand of the throne of God, consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, why? So that you may not grow weary or lose heart. When you look to Jesus, who has promised to finish what he starts. You will be in a position to overcome every failed expectation yeah. in your life. Amen. But you gotta keep looking toward Jesus. Amen. Now, child of God, you can look toward Jesus and see the end result, but still have to walk as the psalmist said through the valley of the shadow of death. And what do you do then while you're walking? expectations. I want you to appreciate today that you and I have to learn to press, to push through. Say all that. Everybody just do that. Just put your hands up and say, I'm going to push through. Don't hit the press behind you. <laughs> do it again. I'm going to press through failed expectations. Here in this text then, we see an amazing description of how the relationship between the eternal God and some human folk, friends, was in many ways a risky proposition. Because you know, Jesus, someone fully God, fully human, certainly had an awareness of what was possible that superseded radically anything that his friends knew. How many of you ever hung out with people who couldn't 
see what you see. Anybody? Anybody? I don't know. You know, they, he, every time you're around them, it's like you're being constricted by them. They just can't appreciate that the world is not falling apart like you think it is. Or maybe they get ready to run into a burning house and they don't see the fire. I had a young person one time, and you know, he was at the school. We all used to work at school together. And you know, I told him, I said, you know what, young fella? That house over there is on fire, and you running headlong into the house. You just running. <laughs> running into a burning house. And I'm trying to stop you from running. But you don't want to listen to me, so sometimes I gotta tackle you. I gotta trip you up. You gonna fall and cut up your knee and hurt yourself, but you still gonna be alive. Because I can see something you don't see. Mm. I pray God puts more people in my life that's willing to tackle me and trip me up. I hope you praying for that too. Some of us, we love burning houses. And I'd rather be alive and crippled than dead and dead. In a burning house. I don't know if that helped anybody in here today. I didn't tell that story in the first service. We tell you later, trip me up if you have to, but keep me out of the burning house. Please, please keep me out of the burning house. Jesus, in these interesting, intimate relationship with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, clearly an expectation of who Jesus was had raised their expectation. And they expected when I I mean, listen, I let Jesus stay in my house for crying out loud. <clears throat> I let him sleep on my couch, on the floor. Maybe in the bed. I fed Jesus. I took care of Jesus when he was tired after walking on water. After healing the sick and raising the dead. Amen. Ain't that something? What? You know, that's a good look. You got friends like that. They surely had high expectations. But when Jesus gets the message that their friend, their brother, Lazarus, had died, clearly Jesus' response let them down. So let me give you a couple tools that I think are important for us as we probably will encounter or are encountering presently situations with God or other people that are letting us down. Causing us to have great expectations. We're waiting by the phone for the call. We're waiting for the promotion. We're waiting for the healing in our body. Waiting for the reconciliation of our relationship. Waiting for our children's life to come on. We're waiting for our bodies to be healed. We're waiting for our check to come. And it's taking too long. How will you deal with the failed expectations? Verse number seven then gives us our first point of principle and opportunity. Uh, verse number 7 says that after this Jesus said to the disciples let us go to Judea again. The first thing you must appreciate if you're going to overcome failed expectations listen, you have to keep showing up. Tell your neighbor, keep showing up. Keep showing up. Keep showing up. Jesus clearly could have opted out of going to Jerusalem because he knew when he got there folk was going to be upset with him. Jesus certainly was someone overcome with grief because his friend had died. Jesus had people around him. The disciples telling him, don't you go to Jerusalem. We just left there, man. They throwing rocks and stuff. <laughs> I don't need no runaway rocks and stray rocks. Jesus, we got to stay here in our place of safety. But Jesus pushed through by showing up. How many of you know that one of the greatest human responses when we have our expectations fail is for us to bail out? I'm out of here. Anybody? Anybody? You let me down? I'm out of here. I mean, we, we, we use the George Bush 
uh, George W. Bush, you know, kind of, kind of, kind of a uh, philosophy uh, when he says, you know, uh, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on you. You can't fool me again. <laughs> with the Father. 
God can do something in this situation that nobody else can. Yeah. Yeah. It's the first thing you got to do, my brother and my sister. In your relationship with God, keep showing up. There's a reason why you should pray every day. Even when you don't feel like praying. Because you're showing up. There's a reason why you should be in worship with other believers every week. Even when you don't like folk. Because that's showing up. There's a reason why you should keep serving and keep volunteering and helping. Because in the process of you showing up, you are giving power to overcome failed expectations. Right. Tell your neighbor, give him a high five and tell him, I'm going to show up today. I'm going to keep showing up. I'm going to keep showing up. I'm going to keep showing up. The second thing that helps you to overcome failed expectations is you got to keep asking questions. Somebody say, keep asking questions. Say that. Come on, say it loud. Keep asking questions. Keep asking questions. Now, I know in church, a lot of us are taught not to question God. Anybody ever heard that? Don't you ask God no question. God is sovereign. If you ask God questions, then you are threatening God's omniscience. <laughs> How many know God ain't worried about your questions? Amen. I mean, He's worried about you, but God ain't like shook because you asked Him a question. God ain't shook because you asked Him why. How many know if you don't ask questions, you don't get answers? And what's the point of going through something and not get answers? <clears throat> Tell you to ask God some questions. That's God. Now, 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 in the text again, you find Mary and Martha, these are friends, homies of Jesus. Jesus didn't show up and they have had, I mean, they feel as though it's been all over the place. Because they saw what Jesus was able to do with other people's lives. Like, man, Jesus, you do this for everybody else, you don't do it for us. What's up with that? Martha runs out to meet Jesus and says, where were you? If you'd been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. Mary does the same thing. Jesus, man, let me down. In the process of their questioning God, they learned something about Jesus they never knew before. Because Jesus told them something about himself, about himself that he never told them before. They asked Jesus, where were you? Why did this happen? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And God's waiting to reveal something to you and I. He's waiting for you and I to ask him. And the second thing I like about this self-disclosure of Jesus is that the truth that Jesus told Mary and Martha has benefited all of us. Yeah. Millennia later. Could it be that some of your failed expectations with God and other people could in fact benefit some folk who are watching how you go through what you go through. Because how many of you know a lot of folk ain't going to ask God questions because they've been taught not to. But if they see you struggling with what does it mean to follow God. See some of us get so spiritually minded that we lose It is to follow after an eternal God. Because how many know God's questions and your questions are two different sets of questions? God's probably sitting in heaven thinking like, hmm, how are we going to keep this galaxy from bumping into that galaxy? And you sitting around here, hmm, how many $30 to pay my cell phone bill? Keep my cable on so I can watch March Madness. Huh? 
then that's not a real relationship. I don't know what that is. That's you playing footsie or something. I don't know. It's, it's, it's very shallow. But if you're in a relationship with somebody, you can ask them, what, what, what's, what's up with that? And they don't flip out on you. What you mean? What's up with that? No, 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 no. questions and you need to be willing to stay even when you don't like the answers. We got a culture today where I'm only hanging around if I like what you say. We like to build an echo chamber. Anybody ever been in an echo chamber where it's like, hey, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. 
this is the third point, the third way you will push through, overcome failed expectations. Live out of God's power. Amen. Somebody say, live God's power out. Say that, live God's power out. Understand, child of God, Jesus. God and man. Jesus clearly engaging and feeling the pressure of failed expectations. Scripture says Jesus wept, overcome with the failure of Lazarus' health. Jesus in his humanity filled with grief. But at the same time, there was something inside Jesus that gave him the boldness to step forward into a death-filled situation and declare, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus surrounded by the professional mourners, by the questioning Mary and Martha, by the reality of Lazarus' death, was able not to dwell in that space, but pull something out of himself that God put there. Lord, help me to preach right now. And there's something inside of you and I that is a deep well of the power of God. Jesus. And you don't have to allow yourself to be limited by the failure of your expectations or the limitation of your humanity. But God is able to help you tap into something that will help you to live out of his power and not your weakness. Hear me, child of God, you're going to have moments this week, this month, this year, where you will be overwhelmed by failed expectations, but the way to push through that is not to allow yourself to drown in it, but to tap into the power of God inside of you and step forward like Jesus did in front of a grave with his friend buried and say Lazarus come forth I know some of us we so smart we just think this is an allegory but I'm here to tell you eyewitnesses said that Lazarus hopped out of the grave the tomb he was dead four days ago he walking around in front of other folk. My brother, my sister, when you live out of the power of God, you can do things that other folk think is impossible. Because God's power is greater than human strength. God, I wish I could preach it. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him God's power is greater than human strength. And how do you then live out of God's power? Well, what you need to do is start with what did God say? Verse number four says that God, Jesus told them, Lazarus' illness does not lead to death, but rather it is so God can get some glory and be glorified in it. Then in verse 25, uh, Jesus told Mary that I am the resurrection and I am the life. And those who believe in me, even though they die, they will live. And, and, and child of God, when you're going to move in the power of God, you got to start with what did God say. You can't start with what did everybody else say. Do what everybody else said don't matter. I wish I had a church in here today that believed that what you got to say about it is not my final declaration. But I believe that if God said it, God will do just what he said. Give it a high five real quick and tell him if God said it, then God will 
know you got something on the inside of you. Through the power of God's Spirit, I can push through. Close your eyes right now. Just get in your mind. What do you need to push through? I need to push through doubt. I need to push through depression. I need to push through low expectations. I need to push through it. Because if I push through it, Jesus has a revelation for me waiting on the other side. Amen. Amen. Jesus has victory and deliverance waiting for me on the other side. Yes. Jesus has a new power. Hallelujah. Waiting for me. Waiting for us on the other side. Amen. Stand with me, everyone.